If you're watching this channel, it's because you don't enjoy watching the world squander what Christendom built, and you want to do your part. Today I'd like to mention one means of doing just that, email made by and for Catholics. Check out Fide Email, that's F-I-D-E-I -E dot email, built for Catholic individuals, families, organizations, and groups. They're private, secure, and of course Catholic. God bless. There is a lot of talk in our time about the church needing to go underground. For the faithful to support priests as they get canceled by the extreme modernists in the episcopate. That we must have masses in our homes if necessary and help provide for the material support of independent priests. Some ask openly why Archbishop Vigano limits himself to writing letters and appearing via the internet at conferences and why he doesn't begin ordaining priests and follow in the footsteps of Archbishop Lefebvre by founding a new traditional priestly fraternity, complete with bishops he himself consecrates, regardless of what Rome thinks about the matter, or does to him as a consequence. Whatever you may think of that solution for the crisis in the church, there has been a lot of serious talk today among traditional and conservative Catholics about the need for an underground church. We return today to examining the things Father Malachi Martin said about the crisis in the church. And here we go into the early and mid-1990s, where he was already talking about the existence of the underground church. And in fact, he had quite a lot to say on the matter. For this episode examining what Father Malachi Martin said about the crisis in the church, I'm going to principally use two or three sources. His work in Windswept House, as well as Vatican, his book, and one of his interviews with Bernard Jansen. And I want to thank the two listeners who assisted me with my Malachi Martin series to date. It is greatly appreciated. Now, in addition, I'll be making some oblique references, again, to the other book I mentioned, to Malachi Martin's book, Vatican, which you should read before you read Windswept House, because you see the official endorsement of the underground church in that book for independent bishops, and especially for the church endorsing the concept of there being independent bishops. And I know that'll be a hard idea for some people to wrap their head around, but you see it there. Before we get to that, I do I want to thank the patrons for their support of Return to Tradition and for the work I do here. It is greatly appreciated. Their support does permit me to bring daily news to you and allows me to put together these more complicated research videos on Father Malachi Martin and similar subjects. Now, if you're interested in joining them and supporting this work, there are links to Subscribestar, which is a speech-respecting Patreon alternative, and Patreon in the description box below, as well as that join button there. It'll cost you like a dollar a month or the cost of a cup of coffee. Anyway, thanks, and let's begin with Vatican. Now, in Vatican, you see the unfolding of the crisis in the church from World War II through the 1980s. The chaos of the Vatican two years, the presence of stonecutters and theological progressives in the church, pushing for so many so-called reforms, that the end result is scarcely recognizable as the same faith as what the church professed before the council. Tied with this are financial scandals that seem rather familiar to us, despite them involving different people, different actors, and taking place 50 to 60 years ago. Against this backdrop, you have a character who was made secretly a bishop by Pius XII, who would keep the underground church connected behind the Iron Curtain. He answered to no one, except the Pope, and eventually only a handful of bishops even knew he was a bishop and cardinal. And even the sitting Pope, who was supposed to be John Paul II, though he never named him explicitly as him, knew nothing about him. Later in Windswept House, we get a different character, who is obviously supposed to be basically the same character, who would take a job in Rome and would work with wealthy Catholics in North America to provide support for independent priests who offered valid sacraments in the chaotic years after Vatican II, into the 1980s, where the book ends. Both characters are supposed to be self-inserts of Malachi Martin. Leave with those things he says in those books, as well as things he said elsewhere, leaving many to speculate that Father Malachi Martin was really Bishop Malachi Martin and was consecrated as such by Pope Pius XII, making his leaving the Jesuits and his work as a layman some kind of essential cover. Now, those are the things with spy novels and such, but that is what people speculate about, and to be fair, there is some evidence that that's actually true. In those books, the priests constitute an independent church, and the Vatican knew about them but did nothing because they had the support of a wealthy and politically powerful family in Texas. But the independent underground church was fully Catholic. The Vatican is like Windswept House in that it is a work of faction, meaning 99% fact with a few bits of fiction to make the story work as a readable story, with largely the names of important figures changed. 
It wasn't only in his written works, though, that Father Malachi Martin addressed the concept of an underground church. In the following clip from an interview he gave with Bernard Jansen in the 1990s, he speaks about an underground church as if it already existed and needed to exist at that time. By that time, he had lost his trust in the popes of the post-conciliar era. All of them. I'll return to that in a moment. First, Father Malachi Martin. Now, we have uh, alluded to it in our conversations up till now, and uh, actually there was in Wimpswept House a uh, proposal for an underground church by Sessi. What role does this underground church play? It plays this role. It provides for a limited number of people a valid mass and valid sacraments. That's very important. But it's only for a certain limited number of people because the, 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 the ministers, the priests and bishops in the underground church are few. The numbers are huge on one side and small on the other side. So from the point of view of numerical significance, none, whatever. But there is this constant thing which is bugging, if I use that awful word, uh, which is bothering the conciliarist church, the normal bishops, that they're attracting more and more people when they can't attract people. And they're attracting vocations to their seminaries when the bishops can't get vocations. Now, of course, we know that some bishops don't want vocations. They're discouraging vocations because they don't want priests any longer. But those are the apostles. That's, what their, that's their function for Satan and for Lucifer is to discourage priesthood. Now, what's going to happen? Uh, what's going to happen is that the church is going to be marginalized more and more. The organized church is going to have its usual crowd of people, never very great. It's not going to have much religious influence. It has very little grace, supernatural grace about it. It's going to have less and less vocations and they're going to have priestless parishes. They have them already, and they're going to have much more than that. And therefore, they're going to be diminished in number and in revenue, and in revenue. And the religious orders are going to go on having very few vocations, the Jesuits. What if they ordained one man last year or something like that? Something dreadful. And the Carmelites and Dominicans, the same thing, a dearth of people. And as for the nuns, forget it, except for certain religious orders. We're not going to have any nuns' orders then religious orders, after about 20 years there will be only one or two big ones and then a sprinkling of small ones and it's all over. We have no orders of nursing sisters or missionary sisters coming up. They're dying out. They're dying out. Note that he separates the underground church from what he calls the conciliar church, a term I know you've heard because people use the term conciliar church all the time. What he really is describing in this and the next clip is that the mainstream church, the conciliar church, is the ape of the church, already, in the 1990s. Now, that's a bitter pill to swallow for many, but clearly Malachi Martin believed that. And note what he says about the religious orders, because that'll hit home for you. Not only are they fading away, but the traditional ones are thriving, and Rome seeks to crush them. And sadly, that's nothing new. I've read news stories from the papacy of Benedict XVI where Rome was going after traditionalist religious orders the same way Francis does today. Whether that was being done by Benedict or by the St. Gallen group and their henchmen in the Roman Curia who were reported to have basically total control of the Roman Curia regardless of who was sitting on the throne of Peter. I'll leave you to decide since I have nothing definitive about that either way, but the point here is this. The underground church exists already, at least according to Father Malachi Martin, and has existed since the 1980s at least. But here you'll see him say something that will bother even more people, that the SSPX are a part of the underground church, though they are, they are certainly not the only priests of it. Now let's um, discuss uh, what the um, components of the underground church is. Uh, we just talked about the Society of St. Pius X. Are they part of the underground church? Yes, they are. Mostly they're underground. By underground, I mean not official. Not official. Functioning with without any approval of the church authorities. Uh, then there are, apart from them, there is the Pius V organization, which is the same status, same condition, they have valid bishops. Now, is there a situation then where another element of the underground church is, let's say, retired um, bishops and priests who, who are training seminarians in secret? 
that's there. That one seminary is composed completely of retired priests who are retired professors, who are told to be retired, who, who are full of energy at the age of 75 and didn't want to retire at all. They want to teach the good theology. So they do. So they're in it. Uh, then I suppose there are minor organizations like the former followers of Father Feeney who be reckoned underground because they don't belong to the official church. They're there, they're tolerated, but they don't belong to the official church. And they always have the traditionalist mass. They don't have the other mass. Um, that uh, roughly is the underground church. Um, you also, I think, have, uh, and I, I've known some priests who have, let's say, um, a parish, oh, yeah. and they function in that parish, but also they're saying um, mass in a clandestine way for uh, small groups of people. Single priests. Sure. I think, wasn't there a, um, um, a precedent for that in the Protestant Reformation? Some sure. Anglican priests continued to so function in a do. clandestine yeah. way. And they do that today. And then the, the last element in the Anglican Church is the reservation of the Blessed Sacrament. We now reserve the Blessed Sacrament in private houses for two parents and their friends. And they keep it there. They know how to deal with it, they know how to keep it clean. They know what to when to renew it, to go to the priest to renew it for them. So we have the, they have the best second because they say we haven't got it in the church. Mm -hmm. We can't make a visit. We can't make a, we can't have exposition of the best segment. And some of them are little monsters. They have exposition for a small group. It's always limited. And uh, it's very hard to find out where it is. And that's one of the difficulties in the modern church is that it's next to impossible to practice your faith there because let's say you go to make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament and the church is locked. It's locked. And if you do, then you don't know where the Blessed Sacrament is. It is there. You sometimes like it's pushed off to the side. Yeah, it's in a box inside the sacristy. It isn't there. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficulty. That's the underground church. Is it growing? Yes, slowly. Very slowly. Nothing big, nothing sudden. I guess the underground church will grow very big when Our Lady's sign comes in the sky. I, then I think it's going to be very high. But the present moment is growing by steadily, 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 by little leaps and steps. And um, if the bishops of this country alone, forget Canada, knew how influential the underground church was, uh, they would really be, they'd get very upset. They get very, very upset. So, um, perhaps though, God is keeping uh, the underground church small um, for reasons maybe that we don't understand, just like in, let's say, the Old Testament, a remnant has kept the faith uh, during right. difficult times. That's right, that's right. Yeah, I think so. But, uh, anyway, you see, Bernard, the belief of the Catholic Church has always been until the present moment that the number of the saved is a minority. Not a majority, a minority. Now you go and tell the normal priest today that, or tell the local bishop that, and they'll spit at you. Because that's very unpopular doctrine today. But didn't our Lord himself say that? Well, yes, but he, our Lord said, said a lot of things, but now the church knows better. This is the argument anyway. Mm. None of the majority would say that, uh, I mean, the majority would say that the majority of believers, the majority of people are saved. The present pope would say that every man at his conception is saved. He would say that. He gets grace at his conception. The pope that he was talking about there, that present pope, was John Paul II, who Malachi Martin had had positive, hopeful feelings about in the 1980s and into the early 1990s, until a visit with him face-to-face, -face, which changed his opinion of him for the worse. The talk of the sign in the sky was something I've covered before, though. While Malachi Martin was a believer in Garen Bandal, which has never been approved by the church and even the local ordinary had rejected it, the sign in the sky is something you'll find throughout Catholic prophecy going back to antiquity. It's certainly not unique to Garen Bandal. The basic idea is that in the final days before the chastisement, where God restores the Catholic faith to full glory for the world to see and destroys the, certains of the servants of Satan in one fell swoop, a great sign will appear in the sky for all mankind to see. Some suggest that the sign in the sky will be a repeat of the miracle of the son of Fatima on a worldwide scale. Others think it will be an unmistakable sign of the cross in the sky. Regardless of what it will be, all will recognize it for what it is, and they will know where they stand with God in those final days. Some will repent, but not many. But repent to what precisely? Remember, if there is an underground church, then it's functionally separate from the ape of the church. 
and according to Malachi Martin, few are members of it. And that is what Malachi Martin is talking about here. The conciliar church, the post-Vatican II church, as the ape of the church itself. He goes into that more throughout his work in his interviews with Bernard Jansen and others, where he talks about how he thinks the sacraments in the post-Vatican II church are doubtful for a lot of reasons. But the most basic reason, because the ordination of the priests themselves are questionable. He has doubts about the right, of the validity of the right. But we've seen hints at this base possibly being true for different reasons in our time. You remember those stories about the invalid baptisms? How many of the faithful were not baptized in the manner the church has taught? How many of the priests? It's a question that we'll never be able to answer, and Rome has never wanted to answer. The subject of invalid sacraments is a touchy one, but let me know if you want me to bring you what Father Malachi Martin said on the subject in a future video. And that brings me to this. My next episode examining what Father Malachi Martin said of the church, state of the church can focus on really one of two topics. Either the question of the sacraments, including Father Malachi Martin's thoughts on, quote, primum, or the Jesuits and what happened to them and their role in the subversion of the church. I wanted to get to the, the Jesuit subjects done for June, given what the secular world is celebrating now. I figured that would be sadly appropriate and in a funny and a kind of dark way, given what the Jesuit order preaches. That video will feature a piece of information I have that no one else has found or presented publicly that will all but exonerate him of the nasty things people have said about him, and I'm getting it from an unimpeachable source. But if you prefer, I can cover what Malachi Martin said of the sacraments in the next episode of this, if you want. Again, a special thank you to the listeners who helped me put together this episode and the information about Father Malachi Martin. It is greatly appreciated, as well as thank you to the patrons of the channel for their support. That is appreciated as well. But let me know what you want in the comments, please. And like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help as to sharing this on social media. That helps a lot, too. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.